Good morning, everyone. A special thank you to Ignacio Socias for inviting me to participate in this important meeting on advocating for innovative family policies. This year's agenda is particularly significant as we are also in the process of commemorating the United Nations International Year of Families Plus 30 in 2024. I would also like to thank the IFFD for their important work, which consistently puts families at the forefront of all their agendas, providing support through meetings, discussions, networking, and other types of resources for families. I have spent my whole career studying families and the policies and programs that are needed to strengthen and support them in many different contexts. However, there has never been a period in my lifetime where the needs of individuals and families has been more conspicuous or more critical than in the last several years. This is true in both Western and non-Western countries. Inequality between social groups and regions is rising to unparalleled degrees and concurrently due to the forces of globalization, in many areas of the world, states are rescinding their social supports, leaving individuals and families to fend for themselves. This has had many social repercussions, and these have only been intensified by the global pandemic of 2020 and the after effects of COVID-19. A fundamental challenge to implementing Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals is that an intensive, specifically Western, individualistic focus and debate in recent years has led to an academic and programmatic lack of emphasis on the critical role that families play in the lives of individuals and communities, and therefore also on the implementation of policies and programs in Western and non-Western contexts. While of course there are many different types of families, the fact remains that there are fundamental obligations, rights and duties of closely related individuals who are bound to one another through emotion and or blood. These relationships continue to remain critical and must be adequately supported in order to contribute to the development of children and the stabilization of adult personalities. Furthermore, shrinking state support for social services around the world is creating an environment in which families are more, not less important to the health and well being of individuals, especially children, those who are ill have disabilities, as well as older persons. The discipline of family science is uniquely positioned to address these issues. Family science provides a lens, research, and a forum for an interdisciplinary examination of these issues. In part, family scientists assess the intended and the unintended consequences of policies and programs on family stability, family relationships, and family responsibilities. In 1996, a classic report in the field by Theodora Ooms highlighted the fact that it is impossible to create social change and a more stable social environment without a clear-cut family focus. She identified four functions of families that are relevant to the successful implementation of social agendas, policies, and programs. One, families provide individuals through membership a sense of personal and social identity. Families give a form of meaning to most people's lives and a sense of belonging that often extends to their communities as well. Two, Families are the unit of basic economic support for their members and for society. They provide shelter, 
food and clothing for their dependents. Three, families around the world continue to be the most efficient unit for rearing and nurturing children, as proven by some failed experiments to raise children in larger group settings historically. Families promote the well-being, education, and safety for children and are the primary resource in early life for social status and morals and values. Four, families provide care for those vulnerable individuals that cannot live on their own, such as the disabled, the terminally ill, and the frail elderly. These foundational aspects of families are the underpinning of all societies. A very strong empirical research base indicates that supportive family environments are still the most important factor in allowing children and youth to develop their full potential. In order for children and youth to flourish and become productive, committed citizens of a society, they need to grow up in an environment that is emotionally supportive and developmentally appropriate. By the time they are school age, children need to be healthy, have adequate nutrition, be securely attached to caregivers, be able to interact in a positive manner with family members, friends, and teachers, be able to communicate in their native language, and be ready to learn. Children who grow up in extreme poverty, who are refugees, who do not have legal identities, or are part of families without legal identities, are much less likely to achieve these important markers than children who grow up in families with more resources, who are securely embedded in stable environments. At this juncture, I would like to mention the issue of poverty. When children grow up in extreme poverty and experience a lack of food, housing, and medical care, they are much less likely to become productive, healthy citizens with the necessary skills to take care of themselves. I need to point out that a problematic aspect to discussing children and families in poverty is that poverty is often defined purely in monetary terms. However, the extremely poor are often faced with multiple disadvantages that extend to their lack of understanding and ability to access their own rights. In a classic article, Brzezinski in 1987 described the conditions of extreme poverty as the following, and I quote, extreme poverty results when the lack of basic security simultaneously affects several aspects of people's lives, when it is prolonged, and when it severely compromises people's chances of regaining their rights and of reassuming their responsibilities in the foreseeable future." Unquote. This definition of poverty is important for the upcoming discussion because it highlights the fact that lacking basic securities can have a cumulative effect on an individual's life and that this insecurity, which is usually family insecurity, can last over an extensive period of time. Moreover, deprivation is often associated with the inability to exercise fundamental rights, making the realization of the sustainable development goals for the most vulnerable members of their respective societies a true challenge. I would like to point out that we also have a situation where economic disparities have widened the gap between families within and between societies. This provides a serious challenge to implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. These development efforts will only succeed if we take into account the protection and promotion of the rights of vulnerable populations, such as the extremely poor, children, persons with disabilities, and older persons, as well as the promotion of equality between women and men in families and communities. These populations cannot and should not be addressed in isolation. 
It is their membership as part of family groups that defines critical aspects of their experiences. This discussion leads us to approaches that are relevant for implementing successful family policies and programs. Over the last several decades, the social sciences and family science specifically have increasingly advocated for adopting what is referred to as an ecological or systems perspective. Based on the work of Yuri Braun von Brenner, this approach emphasizes that individuals do not exist in a vacuum. Instead, they live, work, and are embedded in a variety of contexts that shape their life experiences and their decision-making capabilities. Every individual simultaneously interacts within various systems with each system affecting the others. And the most critical system to which an individual belongs is the family. Fundamental concepts about values, about the distribution of resources, about gender relationships, and about the delineation of tasks are initially realized in family contexts. These decisions in turn affect the relationship that individuals have with their larger school, work, and community environments. By shifting our unit of analysis away from individuals to families, and specifically to families and how they interact with different systems, such as the government, the economy, schools, etc., we can begin to create an enabling legal and policy-based framework that moves towards rights for vulnerable populations, gender equality, and greater social equality for our global citizens. Policies that strengthen and support families reduce the risks that are brought about by poverty, dislocation, climate change, and crisis. By incorporating into all of our work a systems perspective, we will be able to design and implement effective, successful policies and programs. The Sustainable Development Goals were conceptualized as systemic, synergistic, and interrelated. Thus, they need to be implemented through an analogous approach. Family policies that allow members to move out of poverty, to negotiate work obligations with family responsibilities, that support healthy environments for children and all other members, and that facilitate mental and physical health are the key to creating healthy environments and a happier and more peaceful world. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the conference. I wish I were in Paris as well. Best wishes.